Title, Distant Promises. You want to take a look at some of the <coughs> promises of the Old Covenant. And uh, some of them are pretty fantastic concerning Israel and its destiny. Scripture teaches the promises of the Old Covenant were not received in the lifetime of those to whom they were promised. Hebrews 11, 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers, pilgrims on the earth. So the ones who understood the promises realized that they would not receive them in their lifetime. They realized that the promises were for the future. to the next principle. Israel, and they knew that these promises dealing with Israel, Israel was promised to be the nation that would rebuild the earth. Turn to Isaiah 58, verse 12. They shall be the, they shall be of thee, and shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundation of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repair of the breach, the restorer of past to dwell in. Now, what's being said here, I'm going to take a look at some scriptures and compare and compare what's being said. Israel would be the nation that would inherit the earth. Israel would be the nation that would rebuild a new world. Now when it's talking here about the old waste places, <clears throat> it's not talking about the places that we have any knowledge of. It's talking about ancient civilizations that existed before the human race was brought forth. So how do you know? Well, if you take a look at what's being said here. There's a word that's called repairer of the breach, the restorer of past to dwell in. The word breach there is separation. <clears throat> what it's referring to is a time in which the design for earthly living was breached and a new design was brought in. Lucifer took God's original design and he separated it and instituted his own design. Israel is not going to rebuild any ancient Adamic civilizations. God won't allow it. Turn over to Isaiah, the 14th chapter. Prepare slaughter for his children, for the iniquity of their fathers, that they do not rise, nor possess the land, nor fill the face of the world with cities. The design of habitations on the earth is not God's design for man. It's Satan's design for man. 
Israel and the Israelites who understood, truly understood the promises, understood that Israel would be the nation that would bridge the gap between the ancient world that God brought into being and the decadent world that came about as a result of the Luciferian influence on the world. Turn to Genesis, the fourth chapter. Seventeen. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch, and he built it a city, and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. Cain was taught to build cities, not by the Lord. Genesis, tenth chapter. Verses 10 to 12. Genesis 10, verses 10 to 12. In the beginning of his kingdom, Nimrods, was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna and the land of Shinar. So, not only was not only was Nimrod building Babylon, he was building other cities. Erech, Akai, Kalna, all of these in the land of Shinar. That's what it says in verse 11. Out of that land went forth Asher and built Nineveh, the city Rehoboth and Kalna. Resident between Nineveh and Kalna, the same as a great city. So they were building cities all over the place. When they were scattered abroad, they were scattered abroad and they just continued building these same cities. They had the ziggurats, that had the <coughs> stature, uh, the design that had been planted by Cain and his descendants. That's the same pattern designed for cities today. Clustered in with <coughs> the life literally being squeezed out of the inhabitants in the millennium that will not be allowed. God is going to use Israel to build dwellings according to his pattern, his design, which were built anciently before the human race came on the scene. So, well, how do you know? Turn to Ezekiel, 26th chapter, verses 19 to 20. <clears throat> Here we have a city <coughs> called Tyre. <coughs> this is not history, this is prophecy. Ezekiel 26, verses 19 to 20, speaking about the destruction of the city. Thus saith the Lord God, When I shall make thee a desolate city, like the cities that are not inhabited, when I shall bring up the deep upon thee. So these non-inhabited cities are in the ocean, in the sea. This city is going to wind up like these other cities. When I shall bring up the deep upon thee, and great waters shall cover thee. When I shall bring thee down with them that descend into the pit, with the people of old time, ancient time and shall set thee in the low parts of the earth, in places desolate of old. With them that go down to the pit, 
thou shalt not in, thou shalt not be not inhabited and I shall set glory in the land of the living so on the ocean bottoms the bottoms of the seas are the ancient pre-Adamic civilizations that were destroyed before Adam was brought forth these were ancient civilizations that Lucifer corrupted and went under judgment now turn to Isaiah 60 Isaiah 60 verses 4 to 5 talks about the liberation of Israel at the second coming. Lift up thine eyes round about and see. All they gather themselves together, they come to thee. Talking about the Lord Jesus. Thy son shall come from afar, and thy daughter shall be nursed by thy side. Then thou shalt see and flow together. And thine heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee, the forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. And it talks about Israel being the center in which all things flow. <coughs> Notice what it says. The abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. The word converted there means turned over. Mm -hmm. So Israel is going to inherit <coughs> the vastness of the ancient kingdoms. She will be the instrument, the nation that God uses to restore the breach in other words, from that period of time, men will live in the design that God intended men to live on this habitation. Israel will be the number one nation governing all the other nations. So it's a promise that the ancients understood. And they rejoiced in the understanding. And they knew it wouldn't happen in their lifetime. Turn to Isaiah 23, verses 17 to 18. <coughs> Isaiah what were they? Isaiah And it shall come to pass, after the end of seventy years, that the Lord will visit Tyre. She will turn to her higher, and shall commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world upon the face of the earth. This takes place in the tribulation period. And her merchandise and her hire shall be holiness to the Lord. It shall not be treasured nor laid up, for her merchandise shall be for them that dwell before the Lord to eat sufficiently and for durable clothing. The manufacture of this city, <clears throat> the city is going to be destroyed. But the things that they manufacture, the things that they have done will go to God's people during the millennial period. <coughs> okay. I don't have the King James here, but doesn't it say, and her gain? Up here, first, it talks about um, that the Lord will deal with her. She will return to her hire mm -hmm. and, that, uh, and commit fornication with all the kings of the world on the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. Her gain and her pay will be set apart for the Lord. Mm -hmm. Does that seem strange? No. Well, her hire... She's called. It's an evil, wicked city. 
Yeah. Then God is going to take the produce of the, his people. Well, I was looking at that as her hire, as you hire a prostitute. Mm -hmm. She will, re uh, will return mm -hmm. to her hire and commit fornication with all the kings of the world. Mm -hmm. And then her gains and her pay will be set aside for the Lord. And yeah. I just thought, all her wrongdoings, God's going to uh, have them set that money aside for him? Sure. Doesn't that sound strange? No. Remember the scripture says, God will take the wealth of the wicked and give it to his people. But here they say he's going to give it to the Lord. Yeah, because the things that she produces mm -hmm. are valuable. <clears throat> uh, it talks about, uh, this is talking about the Revelation 18 city, the great harlot. There has been no city up until this point that has globally been the center of the whole world. This is saying every city on the face of the earth she's going to commit fornication with. That's future. Mm -hmm. Every city up until this point has been regional, not global. There is no one central global city that dialogues, that trades, that commits fornication with all the kingdoms and becomes the central hub of the whole world. No city has done that yet. Only regionally, not global. But this says on all the face of the earth. So it has to be future. It has to be one city that dominates. And Revelation 18 talks about the harlot city that has committed fornication with all the kings of the earth. I'm just thinking now, in this fornication, is this mean... Because uh, the Bible uses it many times to talk about people who worship other gods. Exactly. Idolatry. It's talking about sorcery. Okay. It's talking about taking what God has made pure and defiling it. And all the ancient cities were sorcerer cities. They had magicians, soothsayers, magi. They were in the yeah. courts of their rulers. Okay. So this is going to be the anti-type of those cities. It's going to commit fornication. In other words, it's going to corrupt <coughs> through sorcery things on a global scale. But God is going to destroy the city with the produce of the city. He's going to save for his people in the millennial period. There's another part. If you, even if you go to 16... Take a harp and go about the city, you forgotten harlot. Make sweet melody, sing many songs that you may be remembered. Of course, you're talking about Tyre. But <laughs> call it a harlot, make sweet memories that you will be remembered. Mm -hmm. And it shall be at the end of 70 years that the Lord will deal with uh, Tyre. And she will return to her higher. Yes, yeah, goes into a period of um, inactivity for 70 years. And then she becomes active again, taking up sorcery. And uh, ultimately becomes so powerful that she dominates the whole earth. Again, it's prophecy. It hasn't happened yet. Uh, so what we find, Israel is going to inherit all of the things that have been brought forth. Now, these, as you read the scripture, you find these people are living luxuriously. They're not living in any ramshackle, run-down environment. They're living in a city of gold, a city of refinement. They are living in the best of the best. And all the merchandise and all the things that come forth are being used by the evil, wicked rulers to ingratiate themselves and, and, and give them the luxurious epitome of life in the world. And God's going to take all that and turn it over to his people. Let's go on. So you find Israel is going to be the inheritor of all things. She will be the one that rebuilds the world after the establishment of the kingdom 
she also will dominate the earth. Now, an interesting principle. Scripture teaches Israel will be divided. The only nation that's going to be divided into two nations. She's going to be an earthly nation and she's going to be a heavenly nation. Turn to Ezekiel, 34th chapter, verse 22 to 25. Ezekiel 34, 22 to 25. Again, this is referring to the second coming. Therefore will I save my flock, and they shall no more be a prey, and I will judge between cattle and cattle. And I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, even my servant David. <coughs> He shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken it. And I will make with them a covenant of peace. And I will cause the evil beasts to cease out of the land, and they shall dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. So, He's talking about what takes place in the second coming. He's going to establish a new covenant with them. The covenant we already have. Now, turn to Jeremiah, the 30th chapter, verses 7 to 9. So at the second coming, when Israel is established as a nation, David is going to be their king. Jeremiah 30, verses 7 to 9. <coughs> Alas, for that day is great, so great that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. But shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck, and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. But they shall serve the Lord their God, and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them, resurrect them. So, Scripture is telling us, in positive terms, that David is going to be resurrected to be the king over God's people. Their king, their shepherd. Now, turn to... Matthew, the 19th chapter, verse 27 to Seven to twenty-eight. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. 
Now, what appears to be is a conflict. We have this prophecy that says David is going to be the king over his people. Jesus said that the twelve apostles are going to sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. All of this at the same time, the second coming. And I wrestled with this for a long time. I said, Lord, how is this possible? Is, it, is the apostles going to rule over David, who rules over Israel? And then the Holy Spirit quickened me. Turn to Revelation, the seventh chapter. Revelation, the seventh chapter, we want verses one to eight. <clears throat> After these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth. The wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed a hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed twelve thousand, of the tribe of Reuben were sealed twelve thousand, of the tribe of Gad was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Nephilim was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manassas was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulon was sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph was sealed 12,000. <coughs> of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. You notice there's one tribe that's missing here. Dan. Anyway, that's a whole other lesson. Mm -hmm. Two things. David is king over the whole nation. The apostles are being, being, to be the judges over the 12 tribes. Now, notice what it says here. You have 12,000 out of each tribe of Israel. Now turn to Revelation, the 14th chapter. When we get there, we want verses 1 to 4. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him a hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. So the hundred and forty-four thousand are now seen in heaven. They are no longer on earth. On earth they were sealed so that they would be supernaturally protected. They go forth, and I believe each one goes forth, and they preach the gospel to their people their tribe. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne, 144,000. And before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand, which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb with us, wherever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Well, what does it mean, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb? It means that they are the first of the nation to come under the new covenant, which enables them 
to ascend to heaven. The rest of Israel is under the old covenant. <coughs> Number two, first fruits. Those that they preach to of their tribes who accept and are killed, martyred, go to heaven. That's why they're called the first fruits. They're the first of the Israelites to ascend before the throne. Those that followed them later on in the tribulation period will become the mass of the rest of the people. <clears throat> so, in that capacity, you have two nations. You have the nation of Israel on earth. You have the nation of Israel in heaven. The apostles are going to sit on thrones judging, judging the because they're going to come up by tribe. The apostles are going to be kings over, or judges over, the twelve tribes in heaven. David is going to be king over the nation of Israel on earth, because the two nations, he says, will be brought together and never separated again. So they'll be king on earth, they'll be judging in heaven. This will be a two-pronged nation, only one that will achieve that. Okay. Now how are they going to get 12,000 from each tribe? Things have been so mixed up, they've been scattered throughout the world. God has preserved them. God has preserved them. But how do they know who's from what tribe? At the time of the revelation, looking at it this way, today they're not tribes, they're countries. When they come out of Israel, there were millions of them, at least three million. It's been 3,000 years. The earth has grown to seven billion people. God has kept the tribes separate, but together. But do, is there anyone that knows that they're together? They, I think they... I believe so. Okay. Yeah. And the other thing is, if we're near the end times, as we believe, they're here now. Sure. They're here. So are the two witnesses. Everybody is here. It's going to play a part in the tribulation period. The 144,000 are here. Yeah. They just haven't stepped into their identity yet because they don't make the rapture. Right. Neither do the two witnesses. All that takes place after the rapture, well into the tribulation period. And they're also prepared as virgins. That's right. God is able to protect them and keep them <clears throat> until the time when they come out. They're calling. Everything is in order. It's fascinating because we're going to see this thing unfold just as the scripture says. What we're seeing now is the taking down of the current order. And this current order, when it's taken down, then the human race is going to function not as nations, countries. It's going to function again as tribes. Man always reverts back to his tribal identity. Time of stresses and things like that. The whole prophecy is consistently talking about man functioning in a tribal capacity. Uh, Ezekiel 38. But under one government, too. Under leaders. Not necessarily a national government. No, not a national, you know, when the Antichrist comes, he's going to form one government. Yeah, well, until he does, the world, the world is going to still remain divided. Okay. Satan has only presented world rule to two men. One of them was Jesus, who rejected it. The other one will be the Antichrist that receives it. When he receives it, then he gets the mantle, because Satan doesn't want it the earth, he's not interested in the earth, he wants to go back to heaven. So he's going to give it to the Antichrist. Matter of fact, turn over to Revelation, the 13th chapter. Revelation 13, verse 13. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet was the feet of a bear, and his mouth is the mouth of a lion, and the dragon 
gave him his power and his seat. The seat is talking about the province, the region that was his headquarters. And <coughs> great authority. So he gives it over to the beast because the beast fits the description of what Satan is looking for, a man to take over the earth while he goes back to the heavens. <clears throat> and notice what it says about the beast. Revelation 13, he's the only one that will dominate the earth. Um, verses, Revelation 13, verses 6, down to... Verse 8. And he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. It was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names were not written in the book of life, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Any man have an ear, let him hear. So he's the only one that's going to dominate the earth. So what we find during this time, there's going to be a great revealing that currently is hidden, but known to God. The 144,000 are all chosen from the bloodline runs from each tribe. And each tribe has been kept separate. I believe they're not tribes as we know no tribes to be, like an Indian tribe within a nation. I believe that they currently are nations, whole countries, because only countries have distinct identities. When this current system falls, then they're going to, this country is going to revert back to its tribal culture. Like if you go to Holland, everybody there is Dutch, except for the, the immigrants who come in. But they have a unanimity of a culture and a language. The same thing is true with uh, Spain, um, um, Italy. Italy. Yeah, yeah, Italy, France, Italy. Germany. They're all homogeneous, uh, uh, a uni a unities of culture and language. I believe the 12 tribes are 12 distinct countries that once this thing falls that they're, they're going to be they are going to be gathered back to Israel uh, because their kingdom the country will not no longer be viable the world system is going to be destroyed and God's going to put it on their hearts just like he's putting on the hearts of these young Jewish Americans to go over to Israel and to homestead the land to build structures in the West Bank to uh, make the land available when he gathers the rest back. That's why anybody that stands against the settler movement, anybody that stands against uh, <coughs> the incorporation of that land, they come under a tremendous curse. Um, Shimon, not Shimon Perez, uh, Ariel Sharon, who was a leading figure in Israel until he single-handedly determined they were going to give up Gaza and shut down Gaza. <coughs> right after that, he wound up with a stroke and incapacitated him. That's what they said. That's why New York took a hit because uh, I don't know who was. Her last name is Rice. Uh, in, uh, in the Obama government. I don't know his oh, secretary. Oh, uh, Condoleezza Rice. Come, is she in his... Uh, oh, she was in the Bushes. Yeah, no. Anyway, he said that it's an atrocity or something for Israel to start building more settlements. I think that's the UN ambassador, Rice. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. And of course, and then right after that, he said that about three days ago and then the next day New Yorkers hit with this. Oh, they, 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 there's a guy that traces every disaster uh, and where people have gone against Israel. 
Well, look at look at curse. look at Yitzhak Rabin. Yitzhak Rabin was the mastermind of the '67 war. He's the one that determined <coughs> that uh, he was a uh, he's an Air Force general, and he determined that uh, Nasser was going to strike Israel and try to cut her off from the south while <coughs> Syria from the north came down. And he said he, he went to um, uh, Golda Meir and uh, he said um, we got to hit him first. Yeah. So they hit the Egyptian Air Force, took him out on the deck. I mean, he just took out his Air Force and went fell swoop. <coughs> and uh, that's when Israel was able to fan out, took down um, <coughs> all the um, opposition. Yitzhak Rabin signed the peace treaty in Oslo with Yasser Arafat. Yitzhak Rabin got assassinated by uh, a guy named uh, Emir, who was a, a, a diehard um, nationalist, Israeli nationalist. And he said he killed them because that, that's what he did. He signed the peace treaty with uh, the Arabs. But anybody that, that stands in opposition they come under a heavy judgment because God is clearing the land out for his people to go back. And uh, you got the churches now. There's a movement now called a replacement. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's called replacement theology. And what it states is that Israel has been totally shut down by God and all the promises of, that were given to Israel are now given to the church. Therefore, Israel is of no consequence anymore. And you had a, now. This is a bunch of influential individuals that wrote a letter to um, Congress and the White House, and they stated that the United States should stop supporting Israel because Israel is illegitimate. They have, they serve no legal purpose because they cut themselves off from the promises of God. And, they, and there are people, there are Christians that actually believe this stuff. Well, it was, yeah, it didn't just start yesterday. It's no, been it's been around for a while. Replacement theology would mean that that's before Israel went back. Yeah. They said, uh, well, Israel's dead and... and the new Israel is the church, so everything that says the Israel promises are ours. Yeah. Plus, you have um, the, uh, the the theology that talks about uh, reconstruction, where the church is going to take over the world, called kingdom now. Yeah. And um, give the kingdom over to the Lord when He returns. That's that's why um, you don't worry about the rapture. Or any other stuff? We got to straighten the world out first. Yeah, the church is gonna, the church is gonna do all this stuff. They're gonna elect Christians into all offices. They're gonna put Christians in positions of power and influence. And uh, ultimately, uh, then it's gonna go into a situation where Christians will set up the kingdom. Uh, you got some powerful people on TBN that believe that stuff. Earl Polk. Um, a church of something like four or five thousand that um, preach that stuff. So you got a lot of deception going on around. Well, there's a guy, uh, Spanish-speaking guy, that says he's Jesus. Huh. Jesus he's of got, suburbia. Yeah, and he's got about five hundred followers. Plus, he's spread out, and now they have I don't know, I'm going to say fifty churches. Uh, but at first he was just, Jesus came into him, now he is Jesus. 